I love how there's this sort of natural lull that happens with no one saying. Um, it's an absolute delight uh, this evening to be able to welcome Lena Godme. Now, this is part of a wider series of talks about uh, portraits of practice, which is looking at really how we begin to think of different forms of practice, feminist practice, um, the ways we approach our work. And there couldn't be a better person to come and talk about their work than Lena this evening. Um, she was born in Beirut, uh, but set up in practice in Paris, and uh, you've had your practice since 2016. I think what's interesting, and we talked a little, very briefly on the stairs about, you know, what might be emphasized, but I think having walked around a number of the studios up in the Diploma Corridor, um, well, the Diploma and Intermediate Corridor, sorry, <laughs> and, uh, is a balance of both a kind of a layered context and understanding of material, a response to history, memory, nature, craft. I think the work is really exemplified in, in uh, exemplified by your work. And I think that there's some fantastic themes that we can draw out this evening, both with your, your table for the Serpentine Pavilion. We also spoke very briefly about the nature of conversation and that a space can be the space for conversation. It can enable or disable that conversation. And that we have an opportunity to come together to talk about all these things and to work through in a spatial manner the complex histories the difficult situations, and our material responses. So I would like to uh, hand over to you to begin uh, to talk through this work. It's an absolute pleasure, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you so much, Ingrid. Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy and honored to be among you here at AA. Such a wonderful school. It looks like home, actually. I love the fact that you have all these rooms full of ideas and of experiments. So that's really fantastic. And it's actually very close to the way we work also in my practice, uh, in a way like an atelier where everything is really about making, about the work of the hand, and uh, somehow about also creating these sensitive spaces that uh, talk about the senses, but also ground us uh, in earth. Because as architects, that's also something that is very unique to us. We always start with this uh, ground that uh, puts us together, and we transpass boundaries to look at different cultures and try to make projects that are really anchored in their place. And we know today that humanity has really become a dominant force in the shaping of Earth. So how can we, uh, and how can architecture actually respond in a way to such a, um, such a happening and how, uh, how human beings became really uh, needing almost two Earths to sustain our uh, consumption? And that's something really that I always uh, seen in Beirut. So I grew up in Beirut, uh, in this city that has been buried several times, reconstructed, and that we always see like a mass of concrete that is encroaching on this Mediterranean Sea. And like this photo of uh, Lebanese photographer Joe Kisirwani, we can see like this always uh, struggle or this uh, kind of uh, dialogue between uh, the built and the natural. And the mass of concrete that is is uh, continuously being built in cities. It also, uh, the city of Beirut really exemplifies situations uh, in the world like housing uh, and the question of resources. This is a photo I took uh, from a stone garden building that uh, I delivered in 2020 in Beirut. And you can see like people inhabiting uh, really uh, like waste. And it questions what, are, what is waste actually and how do we produce waste both uh, in terms of uh, our human relationships, uh, the, like uh, human intelligence, but also in terms of materiality. Waste is very much visual and uh, visible in uh, such a city, uh, while in other places maybe it's not visible, we don't see uh, all what we produce as waste. We see it more clearly in uh, Beirut because of certain crises, of governmental crises and situations where waste management is not able to be sustained, so we can see it and it's becoming like, it becomes a question to us as humans but also as architects. 
What's interesting in the advent of the Anthropocene is also that it brings an end to this binary vision that we may have between us as humans and nature. And there's no really dichotomy between us and nature. And somehow uh, the whole world becomes, in a way, interconnected and thought as one. So there is no sense anymore to talk about nation, about boundaries, in such a common uh, issue that we have to deal with. And scientists really tell us that we are actually more microbes than we are human beings. So at the end, uh, how much uh, nature is, is there in us? And we're more like 40% or 43% of our total uh, cells are of uh, human nature and the rest is microbes. So maybe Arshim Boldo was right, somehow we are made of uh, vegetables, we're made of uh, this environment, this bacteria that constitute us. And that brings us this question, how much nature in architecture? So how much we, nature, maybe nature in its uh, direct form as uh, vegetation, but also more than its direct form uh, in terms of how it relate, makes us relate to history, it relates us to the ground. One photo here of Beirut, we can see this archaeology that is constantly revealing in Beirut. Every time we dig in, we see history, we see civilizations that are revealed again, and then nature is coming uh, and uh, eating up uh, that, uh, that traces, these traces of civilizations that are, have passed. Things that we see also are these informal ways of making the built environment and uh, looking at nature as an organic uh, uh, presence in that built environment. And then moments of archaeology uh, that I've been able to spot around the city. Like as I walk in the city, I always looked at uh, construction sites and we have discovered archaeologies that suddenly get very quickly buried away because there is no archaeological uh, conservation plan in uh, Lebanon. Uh, and it actually is very interesting because it tells us about this relationship as uh, humans we have with the ground, but also the architecture as a way of weathering away, that uh, thinking about architecture as a, in a constant becoming where every material is constantly transforming and it's always a matter of scale of time. And I like this photo of this obelisk that was found in Egypt that was, uh, that was not finished. It's really under sculpture. And it shows uh, also a form of making from the ground, from the resources. It was interesting in one of the studios they were talking about the void, the creating with, with the void, with the resources of the place, uh, but also thinking about architecture as an act of uh, hollowing rather than of uh, building. So somehow thinking about the evolution of how we build in space and maybe thinking about us digging in uh, and maybe emerging from uh, the place as a kind of continuity, as almost a quest of a Darwinian uh, evolution or like a typological uh, tree that is in constant evolution in a place. And talking about my atelier, it looks a bit like this. It's about uh, thinking of different materialities, thinking about research, like research-driven uh, uh, approach to the project. Uh, so it, it's a series of photos, of theories, of text, uh, sometimes materials, models. So really thinking about this uh, constant dialogue and dealing with complexity is essential also in the making of architecture. So a series of attempts of model making, of the hand always present, even if we're working in computer, it's always like this dialogue between the hand and the tools, the digital tools that we may have. And then this is uh, a work that is brought on different scale uh, and always with this intimate relationship with the material that goes from the scale of a chair that we've done uh, for a renovation of a restaurant in Palais Tokyo in, uh, in Paris or uh, this hanger that is uh, like a detail uh, in an earthen uh, bar in, in this restaurant. So really looking at this micro scale and this relationship with the, with the material or experiments and working with artisans, for, for example, glass making here, and uh, looking at how the material transforms and how can we use it in architecture and in different scales of architecture, and in that case, in a chocolate boutique in, uh, in France, in Paris, or even uh, looking at different practices, cultural practices and relationship to porcelain and ceramics, and this is in Arita, looking at how to value, again, uh, the, the, the making uh, of the hand and the 
the working of ceramics that has been uh, like a tradition from uh, one generation after the other in uh, Japan, and that also has lost its interest the, the, the past uh, decades because um, like the young generation didn't want anymore to do uh, such uh, handwork, and it's coming back again. So the, the way of uh, working with these as partly of exhibiting also this uh, the craft and trying to uh, to give it value again uh, through architecture and through uh, set design. So if we look at uh, this field, it's somehow for me uh, located between archaeology, between future, between huma humanity and nature. When we're talking about archaeology, it's about digging, it's about uh, researching, linking to the past, looking at what had been there, to the traces of what is present in, in a place. Uh, and uh, humane or humaneness is because we're looking at an architecture that is inclusive, that talks about uh, society, that talks about bringing us to get together, but also about the power of the hand, of crafts, of relationships. If we're talking about nature, it's about nurturing, but it's also about beauty, about uh, the land, about bringing uh, the environment as part, of, as, as an integral part, actually, of the process of architecture. And the future, because every act of architecture somehow has a sense of newness. There, even if it's an innovation, there is always a sense of newness that we're bringing. And in that, there are different modes, actually, of making uh, architecture, but also of uh, maybe thinking about architecture as a way of resisting, of resilience, or of really bringing sensitivities through, uh, through a way of bringing people together also in a space. And, and I would like to talk about that through different projects. Like one of the first projects that I started my practice, uh, pr partnership practice uh, with, actually, is the Estonian National Museum. And that's a project that was an open competition uh, in 2006 uh, and that we won. So I was 26 at that time and uh, participated in this open competition. And suddenly in 2006, we get the call that we won this project and I established my first partnership practice. So it's a 40,000 square meters in uh, Tartu, uh, Estonia. So Estonia is really south of Finland and Tartu is the cultural capital of Estonia. So as a cultural capital, it's really a place where all the performances were happening, where also Estonians were uh, creating and affirming their identity as a finno ugric identity during Soviet occupation. They got their independence in 91, and they continued this kind of assembly of objects. So this relationship with the object is also about creating this identity, but also creating a different expression and relationship to space. And what was particular about the site is that there is this uh, large scar that cuts into the site, but that the brief didn't talk about during the competition. And uh, it, the site actually was really away from uh, the scar. And as we researched, looked at this uh, site, we discovered that this is like a, looks like an airfield and discovered that the site actually was the site where all the Estonians struggled for their independence, where they rallied and uh, claimed for, the, for their independence from the Soviet times. And it turned uh, very uh, clearly to us that the building actually cannot be just an icon, a museum that sits uh, independently on a site, but it has to really link to that airfield and maybe uh, bear a role that is not about only uh, being an architecture, a beautiful architecture sitting on a site, but that is able to transform the site itself and that links to that airfield that has a negative history and becomes uh, another realm. And somehow the building in that sense becomes uh, almost a land art or becomes like an urban generator that acts on the territorial scale and links to this airfield to die in it. So it's both a, a building that has its monumental capacity since it dies into the landscape, but it also uh, is able to uh, disappear within the landscape. And in a way, through this connection, uh, the museum has two entrances, which contradicts actually the program of a museum. So it does actually open what is a museum and how can a museum function with two entrances, opening the narrative also of the exhibition itself. 
And this platform becomes a platform for people. So the architecture is a place for people to gather, to be together. And this, is, this was clear uh, when we started the construction where the Estonian just gathered uh, to go and uh, put the first stone for the building. And this is where I started getting scared because I realized that as an architect, we have a huge responsibility when we're building. So how do we build and how do we build places for people? And the scale is important. So how do we, uh, how are we able actually to give intimacy also in the spaces? So while this project has this large span that links to this uh, platform, it also fragments into smaller spaces that link, uh, that create like more intimate spaces, almost like the scales of the houses within the realm of the building itself. So there are a series of uh, spaces within where we have the public spaces, the uh, exhibition uh, spaces the uh, like uh, all the conservation department and then again another public space that we uh, like uh, defended on the other side of the building <coughs> and as I was saying actually the collection is read in multiple ways so you don't have only one entrance but you have this capacity of looping so the narrative of discovering the collection is always multiple and in that sense the identity is in constant uh, construction as well one of the specificity also of this facade is uh, that it look, looks like a gown. It's a gown uh, on a body, almost echoing these patterns that many women were knitting in Estonia, and th that were also a way for them uh, to claim for the independence, for res like almost resisting the times of the occupation. It was a, like an invisible sign because they couldn't actually uh, riot or they couldn't go against uh, that uh, this, uh, this these times, but the the knitting and making was a way also to create another language uh, by physical uh, matter. And in that sense, this facade is also bearing this uh, trace uh, with this uh, pattern that, uh, that is gowning the, the building itself. And then one thing inside the building and the museum is to defend these open spaces, spaces of generosity, where uh, between the functions, spaces are large and uh, like activities could happen, but also like uh, what, what I may call like uh, uncertain spaces that are not programmed, where the users can make their own program, they can explore it, and they can actually create the culture within these spaces. So here, for example, we can see where the building becomes a bridge. It becomes a large... Uh, place where they do their uh, performances and where they actually produce their culture. And in between, there are other spaces like the library, for example, here, and then we go into the collection and it becomes an educational space. And as we move further, the building really kind of uh, meets the ground and it becomes almost like, uh, like the ground itself. And then we are like opening into this uh, uh, this open ground that is uh, dying with the landscape. Something that we learn also in working in uh, such climate is also the relationship with the climate. So here we are at minus 20 in winter time. So how do we build in such a climate? And how to re reduce, uh, actually, the consumption of the building? So the, the whole project was thought also in a way to, to uh, reduce its uh, consumption in terms of energy, uh, putting the collection in the underground, using material that stabilize the, uh, like the, the humidity, et cetera. I want to show here like a movie that was done by uh, like cinematographers, Estonian cinematographers, uh, that show also how like spaces can be uh, appropriated in a completely different way than uh, expected. Uh, like for example, here they appropriated one space leading into the uh, uh, underground uh, with this uh, soap uh, bowl. Uh, balloon, and then here we can see like the the canopy actually of the entrance, uh, where wo a woman is knitting and uh, working uh, with the, with the textile work, and then again with this space where we can feel almost uh, the man is moving, uh, and he's actually uh, we will discover in a bit, just uh, standing in uh, in the bridge area that is over the the lake. And when we delivered the project, uh, I was keen to, to, to know actually what people felt, because this is a project that took 10 years. 
uh, and what does it mean for them? And some of them were saying the museum acts as a bridge between two shores, and one side is the past and the other is the future. So it's helping them to turn uh, their heads from that past and uh, think about the future. So what kind of symbolics, what kind of evocation can architecture hold, and what can it do, actually, for people? Moving to another context in Beirut and uh, where I grew up, uh, this project is uh, a housing project, but uh, it's also housing uh, like a gallery space on the ground floor. And it's a very particular site. So here we are in uh, close to the uh, port area, uh, adjacent also to the city center. And this building is really about this relationship to Beirut, to the history of Beirut, but also the city that is in constant construction, that is constantly, uh, like it actually portrays what's happening in the, in the world, but in a very small geography. So you have all the disasters that are happening actually in the city in Beirut and in Lebanon. Uh, but you learn a lot. You learn about the contradiction of the environment. You learn about the contradictions of the systems and the dynamics that produce, actually, the built environment and that produce architecture. And the place of nature within this as an organic uh, presence that is just uh, coming in, uh, in between these spaces. And in a place where there is no one urban plan and the city is constantly in stitching, it looks like Zarina Hashimi is drawing, like constantly as a palimpsest that is uh, er erased and rewritten in, in, uh, in, constant, uh, in a constant way. Something that uh, is always beautiful to see are these old houses that are uh, built during the Ottoman time in Beirut, and these houses uh, always have uh, like delightful spaces. Like in this photo for Adel Kuri, we can see these staircases that are leading into the second floor, and where nature is coming through. So uh, sometimes I show this to my uh, developers and tell them, look, we can still do nice staircases. They don't have to be just uh, stuck in a building inside. But also the city, because of these contradictions, is constantly in uh, life. Uh, there is always uh, like a presence of life and the survival instinct in a way that links us to a deep history, but is also looking at the future. So the site here is really this building. The, the building uh, was uh, housing one of the first concrete factories in uh, Lebanon. And it's also uh, the place where uh, Pierre Khouri, who is the father of photographer for Adel Khouri, had his um, office. Pierre Khouri was a modernist architect in uh, Lebanon. Uh, so there was kind of uh, memory of architecture, but also a struggle between uh, a father and a son who inherited that, la that land. I will talk about the struggle later. Uh, and this is also a site that is very uh, close to the city center. So the city center of Beirut was completely destroyed after the war and also was completely rebuilt very quickly. So you can imagine someone, a body is scarred, but yet you force it to heal in a very quick manner. So somehow the, uh, the uh, memory of, uh, of the war was somehow forgotten very quickly. So, and it did cause also an amnesia uh, in, uh, in the governance of the city itself, of the country itself. And some of the few photos uh, that remain show us actually the atrocities of what the war can produce and how we can see actually this built environment completely hollowed, the materiality also that is revealed out of uh, that, moments of contradiction of life and death at the same time because as human beings we constantly want to survive, we want to, be, uh, to live actually despite all the destruction. And Fouad al who uh, actually studied at the AA, apparently, he did uh, one uh, year here. But when we, he heard uh, Zaha Hadid wanting to build on the moon, he just dropped and uh, became a photographer and fought <laughs> with his band. <laughs> <laughs> he fought with his dad because uh, uh, his dad told him actually photography is not a job. So he ended up traveling the world and uh, taking various photos. But some of the precious photos that he took were photos of Beirut in 91, uh, where uh, Solidar, who is the company who uh, like uh, renovated the city center, uh, hired him, uh, Gabriel Basilico, uh, Kodelka, like four or five photographers to take photos actually of the city center. And it is 
actually one of the few records that we have of the uh, like atrocities that happened in the, after the war and uh, how not to actually go again into that cycle. And we could see actually how uh, also we as human beings become like our environment. So this photo is always striking me because you feel this man that is frail and that almost looks like, his, uh, like these buildings actually completely hollowed up. And when visiting sometimes Beirut in, uh, back in 2012, I went with my students in uh, France to visit these buildings, some of the, the hollowed buildings. One of them was uh, what we call the Yellow House, is a house that is located on the demarcation line between Beirut East and West. And we could see this kind of uh, hollowing of the facade, but also the power of nature, of light, and of people to bring life again. So the building is a reflection on that. It's, of course, not a linear reflection, uh, but it's also about uh, the memory of what I had lived in the city, what we had lived in that uh, country, as well as many Lebanese share the story. And how can arch architecture, if it's the housing, how can it offer something to the city again? And what is an opening, actually, within a dwelling? How does it, uh, how does it frame the outside? How does it become more as a tool, actually, that uh, brings the city differently within the household? Almost like a photography uh, to, to the city, but also a critique of, of these sometimes contradictions and uh, uh, craziness of, uh, of, that, uh, of that place. So we could see here like a highway, that underneath it, the bus station, a tower, like an old house behind, or um, panoramic view towers, the silos, uh, and these openings that, uh, that are like eating up the, uh, the spaces that become double height and that echo the memory of, uh, of the city. And these openings are also openings of life. They actually shy away from a practice that is very much present in uh, Mediterranean cities, which is doing balconies and then glazing them. So I try to think how can we actually avoid that, avoid glazing these uh, balconies and maybe going back to traditional forms, which are these loggias that could be uh, become places for uh, nature uh, to be uh, part of the building. And how, as the building rises in a very seismic area, so as you see, uh, it was a it's a concrete shell. Uh, Beirut is a seismic area; it, it's subject to uh, earthquakes, and it was actually there was an earthquake recently when uh, it hit Turkey. So the whole building has to have a structural uh, capacity and act also uh, resiliently. And then the facade for me was also a tool. It's a tool to bring the hand of uh, the skilled hand of many workers that are fleeing the war, and namely here they were coming from Syria that work uh, in, on site, and how to, to bring them as part of the uh, emotional process of making architecture. So, to, and making it by hand. So also again, uh, like trying to escape the uh, standard uh, like molds that we employ in uh, construction sites. And maybe thinking about this envelope as a way of bringing the ground up, almost like a vertical archeology. span and thinking about like uh, combing the whole elevation. So the whole elevation was combed by hand with this uh, tool uh, that uh, we drew. And all the process started with these small models that uh, we produced at the office. These are like clay models that were done with forks, so like really doing with forks. That's why I love these kind of very artisanal uh, you know, models that I've seen above. Uh, and then looking at the scale, how this can become a scale, how can we like create this tool actually to make the building, to comb it, uh, and then after making it uh, with, the, uh, with the team. And it was really like um, nice to hear the, uh, the artisan saying like, oh, uh, I didn't sleep yesterday, I figured out a way to do this uh, facade. And so, so they were actually <coughs> like us, like, you know, you don't sleep when you're doing a project, so somehow you're into the, uh, the emotional process of, uh, of building and of making. And, and, and in a way, also, uh, there was a question about nature. How can nature exist within this context and in, within this building? Nature in Beirut exists in an organic way. 
there are very little parks. There, you know, it's not tamed. It's just present whenever you have a left outside. It just uh, comes out of a ruin, and it's also present in many balconies of these uh, residential buildings because it's a Mediterranean climate. So you put put a pot, and then it uh, it flourishes. So the idea was to bring that practice as part of the architecture of the building, and then it's really uh, embedded in the planters within these windows, and somehow allowing different scales of nature to exist within this building. So the small windows are housing really small uh, pots, and the big ones are having like more large trees. And in a way, this, uh, the, the presence of nature on the upper floors is also linking the building to the ground. And somehow we can see like this relationship to the ground that is happening. And the shape of the building is about also uh, re like um, manifesting the building regulation that sometimes is very uh, like that remains uh, invisible, and, but it actually governs all what we see. So how uh, like these lines that uh, allow you to go at a certain height and then hit your building and then somehow trying to make it visible here within the building. Because it could have been possible to do a tower like by really reducing your footprint on the building, but while we actually eat up the whole site, uh, then it uh, forces uh, the building to react to the uh, to the lines uh, that uh, of the of the regulation. And then from the other side, what we can see is um, like. A question also around uh, like the housing typologies that we can see in uh, mushroomings in many parts of the world, and that are about this kind of typical typology of uh, houses uh, that have the same plan, that are dictating the same social construct. And by these windows and the organicity of the uh, puncture, punctures of the building, uh, they create actually different floors along the different heights of the building. So we could see like uh, sometimes these gardens that create individualized uh, modes of living. So it's not really the same uh, apartment from one uh, level to the other. So maybe advocating also individual individuality appropriation within uh, this uh, this uh, like building. We can see here some views from the inside. These were photos that were taken actually before the explosion in August 2020 that hit uh, the port uh, of Beirut. Uh, and then the entrance is about like a womb uh, kind of structure that uh, talks about intimacy also within the uh, this structure. And then the ground floor with this uh, like uh, space for uh, exhibition. Uh, and it's a platform for uh, image and uh, talk about the production in the Middle East. Uh, and it's a raw space that is left for you know appropriation. And this is something also that uh, we wanted to talk about with this model that what was exhibited uh, back in uh, the Venice Biennale. And it was about really talking about uh, talking uh, through uh, like the grounds of uh, Beirut uh, and uh, Lebanon because of the risk that is constantly present uh, as a way also of um, like as a fertile ground for artists and the role of artists within uh, this context uh, because they become actually the voices uh, to critique the voices of uh, creating uh, uh, alternative voices uh, to, uh, to you know to politics so there was a series of uh, photographies that uh, we I curated inside the, the building and uh, also within these photographies or close to them we could see movies that talk about also Beirut during the 80s uh, and where people talk about their endurance uh, during the war and what is actually crazy is that it's still the same uh, thing happening today so and it's also about how do we get uh, you know how do we surpass such a context one thing also like here we can see in this photo uh, is uh, the uh, landscape after the, the uh, um, explosion that happened on the port area. And we can also sense better the scale of the building next to other uh, towers. Uh, and just after the explosion, uh, the building really was uh, somehow intact. The facade was intact. I was quite scared that it's, uh, it will be 
like uh, destroyed uh, but thankfully all this work of the hand all the nature that is in the windows w was uh, really s stayed in place of course all the glass was shattered uh, but the building really resisted such an explosion somehow almost like a bunker that uh, protected its inhabitants we can see here the south facade. So this facade is bound to be covered at some point. So these are like small punctuations that are really ventilation points or uh, like ducts that allow, uh, uh, you know, uh, ventilation for mechanical uh, parts. And by measuring the openings also in a Mediterranean climate, the building was not only able to sustain that event, but is also a thermal mass that is able to control the, uh, uh, you know, like the loss of, um, uh, like the, the, the heat inside. So I'm always like critique, I always critique these glass towers actually that are emerging in very hot environments. So you have to really control that and somehow maybe talk about almost a vernacular aspect to uh, building a tower in such a context. Staying in Lebanon, uh, this uh, project is a museum in uh, the mountain in uh, Lebanon. So somehow, sometimes maybe there are many Lebanese here in the AA, you can hear that we can uh, go to the beach and ski in the same day. It's true. <laughs> You have the mountains, it's very close, and so you just go like one hour and you reach uh, these mountains. And it's really interesting because it's a contrast of uh, also landscape or buildscape, so moving from a very dense environment uh, towards nature. So this contrast is always present and it always solicits you like, how do we build and how do we re-relate re to nature despite what we have destroyed? And uh, this project is about uh, building an archive museum or maybe a new typology of museums also uh, by a collector that has been collecting about the history of uh, Lebanon uh, through the eyes of artists. And maybe thinking about the history of uh, the museum typology itself, maybe it's a cabinet of curiosity, it's a tip of an iceberg because most of the collection doesn't need light. Thinking about maybe what is the ancestor of a museum, is it the pyramid or like the uh, um, like cabinet of curiosity, the Pompidou, and maybe thinking about the museum or the archival museum as a home, as a place that echoes this typology, uh, which is this uh, Liwan house, that is a typical typology of uh, house in uh, Lebanon. And the Liwan is a very particular uh, with this uh, hole in the center that is a ventilated hole and where you have different rooms that are related to it. So we thought to cross with the typology of the Liwan and think about the, uh, the museum as a whole uh, that uh, is a meeting point between different archival rooms. So the hall becomes a library, a theater, a place for uh, like uh, viewing, uh, but is also what is revealed out of this landscape. So all the museum is dug in the landscape and we kind of keep the quality of that landscape that is exemplifying actually the topography of, uh, of a part of Lebanon. And then it becomes a meeting point between the different rooms, but also the landscape is a place for art, is a place, an extension of the art place within the, uh, uh, the inside. And then as we enter this hall, there are the separate rooms that we can uh, move into. And maybe also thinking about the museum as a more interactive uh, place rather than a place where we consume art, where we look at art only, but we interact with art. So somehow we enter into this uh, platform and then we are invited to uh, go around these ramps uh, and as we go around these ramps we open uh, artworks that we open an archive and then we create our own scenography and our own curation within uh, the space and the rooms that are tucked in between uh, like along this uh, hall are spaces where the, uh, the visitors can sit around the table, they can uh, take out a, uh, like a painting or a work and then study it together. And then the building is like sitting in the landscape. It's really uh, like protected by that landscape, but it's also uh, somehow uh, working in an ecosystemic way with this landscape. <laughs> Uh, another project where pushing the boundary of uh, sustainability, and this is uh, the last project we just uh, 
realized in uh, Normandy, in uh, France. And this is the first uh, low-carbon energy positive uh, building in, um, in France at the moment. And it's, uh, it's about really thinking how uh, to build an industrial place in a different way and giving really uh, maybe dignity to industrial spaces. We're used to industrial spaces as metal tins, as we see around, and how to uh, give really another architecture to that, such places and build with the resources of the place that we have. So here looking at this landscape that is very beautiful, that is very, uh, you know, like it's uh, Normandy, so it's very uh, humid. But also looking at all the activities that are happening within, there is the work of the hand, this uh, work of this, uh, you know, precision also, and thinking how to bring this precision back to the architecture also. So somehow also the trace, like the, the presence of the trace in the building itself, and when thinking about resources, it's about also locating the resources in the place. And here we identified actually three local brick makers because the earth is very uh, like uh, very uh, clay-like, so it's really perfect for making bricks. And by sourcing the, the material locally, we reduce our carbon footprint. So the idea was actually to start to work and build this project through the material instead of thinking about an architecture and then looking for the material afterwards. And to reach a very uh, carbon, uh, low carbon and energy positive building, there were three parts that, or two parts that we have to look at. One is the energy, the other is the carbon. And of course, all this, how to create out of this a, well, a place for well-being. So when we look at the energy, actually, uh, we see that actually an industrial place is a place that consumes a lot of energy. And there is a very close work to do from a regular building until to reach an energy positive building. One is a bioclimatic building. It's actually something that we've been doing for uh, centuries and that in modern cities we have maybe uh, like put aside. And it's about really thinking about the resources in the place, thinking about the program itself, how to compact the program uh, in relation to its uh, location, thinking about the flexibility also of uh, the use within the space, uh, how to uh, you know how to make the optimal uh, functioning of the building because it also serves us to uh, to reduce our impact on this uh, on the site itself and then the whole uh, site uh, or the whole plan is made out of these units of uh, atelier where they manufacture uh, leather and this place uh, the meeting point which is this at the center of the uh, building and then it's about looking at light, ventilation, and nature, and really just simply looking at how to position the like ateliers uh, towards the northern light, the workshops, so they get the best light inside, and we reduce the use of electricity, how to make uh, the ventilation within the building so you need less uh, air conditioning, uh, how to use the trees to shield the facade when it's in summer, so basically the leaves shield the facade from uh, heat, and the, the reverse happens in uh, winter time. And also how to create a whole ecosystem in terms of the landscape around uh, the building itself. And we realized actually by doing these actions that we reach a zone of comfort, uh, actually our zone of comfort as human beings. So it becomes more easier actually to, uh, to heat or to uh, cool the building. So you don't need a lot of effort to do that. So just by these simple acts, you start to get closer to a more virtuous building. And then producing uh, low and carbon uh, like uh, energy intake, of course, uh, we have to calculate also the um, footprint of solar panels that come from whenever they come. And then using geothermal energy and uh, stocking all the surplus of energy of the building. And then in carbon footprint is really almost like you have to peel the building, like every material becomes uh, important and has its own carbon footprint and we have to be able to calculate it. So working with bricks. Uh, here and then uh, as we see here when we were doing the site we can see the earth of, from uh, the site and again archaeology. So we had discovered actually uh, funnily enough that in this place there was a Magdalenian uh, foyer 
and the people used to also uh, manufacture needles and work by hand. So somehow the place itself has its own history, its own uh, weight uh, somehow. So we did these 500,000 bricks that were manufactured very close to the site in a very traditional oven. Uh, and there were, there were also a way to uh, re-boost uh, the work of the hand, uh, to, to work with the local uh, manufacturer who, who was just working with renovations today. He wasn't doing any contemporary architecture or any uh, structural uh, projects with brick and, and somehow use the site uh, as a way to bring back this knowledge of masonry and we started uh, working with uh, master stone masons, uh, in this case uh, brick masons, to, uh, to train uh, 10 uh, masons and uh, work together uh, to lay uh, the, build, the, the bricks uh, one by one. Something that struck me also in this process of construction is that they had to print actually the whole facade in one-to-one, -one, the drawing, to do this work. So also the drawing of the architect became back to the site and became a tool also of making. And they were very proud uh, to do the building. <coughs> And then, yeah, and then uh, also it's really like this idea of going to the micro scale again and the act of making. So you have to uh, really de design the building and draw to the brick scale. So it really orchestrates all the uh, uh, scale of the building. And then these arches that are very thin and they span. Uh, 10 meters. And with the, the tools today, we could calculate the material, optimize it, and go very thin in the, uh, in the drawing of these arches. And the drawing was about also this gallops of the horse, because this is a place where they make saddlery. So it echoes also this movement of the horse and this uh, dynamic of the, uh, uh, of the gallops, in a way, uh, with this thickness of the facade that talks about the body of that horse as well. As we look at the site, we see all these natural materials, and then we can also figure out here with this model the, the brick structure versus the uh, wooden uh, structures that uh, constitute the roof here. It's always interesting also to think about these kind of uh, elements that constitute our buildings, but also the relationship between the thinking process and the making process. So the building is a tool, it's a place uh, that is living, it's a place for time, and that lives with time. So we enter here into the outside where there is this uh, courtyard where nature is part of the building itself. Uh, and it's a place where people meet, uh, they relate to nature, they plant uh, herbs, they have a vegetable garden. And then there is a foyer where the, uh, the artisans meet. You can see also the formwork here for uh, making the saddlery that really echoes the arches within. And all the work uh, of, uh, of the hand. Uh, and then again here, like places where the light is coming. So it's really a place that is um, full of life and full of objects because it's a place of making. It's an industrial, actually, ground. And usually they're used to spaces that are quite uh, cold, very metallic. And uh, when they moved to this place, they were saying that they felt they were going on vacation. And I like this idea, actually, that why we should go to work. I mean, we should feel work as a, like a pleasure. And it's so important. And spaces do maybe have an impact on our life. So nature is now growing. And actually, here we can see also the formwork that we use to make the arches are becoming benches. So they, uh, all, everything is reused. And all the bricks uh, that are used uh, in the building, the, like the, the leftovers, we use them as drains around. There is also um, like a beehive here. And yes, we see that, and some horses are running, actually not to, next to the building. I, I'm, I'm convincing the client to bring a horse uh, and shoot uh, in front of the building, but I didn't uh, manage yet. I'll, I'll go more quickly on this project, actually, to uh, move to uh, the Serpentine. But this is a project that we did uh, around sustainable feeding. Uh, and uh, it's a bit a precursor to uh, some of the ideas in the Serpentine Pavilion. It's a wooden structure. It's about how do we eat more sustainably uh, today. 
Uh, and a table is about that, is about also more than eating, actually. It's uh, symbolically about eating, because the idea here when doing the serpentine was how can we uh, echo the zeitgeist of the moment in a way, because serpentine is talking about the times that we live in. Uh, and the idea was to bring people together in assembly, but also uh, think about this relationship we have with Earth. And one of the first relationships that ties us to Earth is uh, food, actually. And is if we eat in a more sustainable way, we're actually living more sustainably. But it's also about rooting. It's about also moments of uh, dialogue that is different, that are non-hierarchical, that are bringing to, uh, us together in an echoing uh, manner. Uh, so we went into this research about uh, moments of food. Um, of course, in, in Lebanon, the food is very important. It's about rooting ourselves. And when thinking about it and our relationship to food, we realize how much we are climate beings because we're thinking about directly Earth. I mean, food grows from Earth, so it's really about uh, our rootedness to our places. So it's really also interesting to see these different uh, performances through time, like the symposium, for example, was a way to, for Greek to meet and to de decide on important matters, but also while all sitting uh, on the table, lying down, all men and eating together. So uh, also maybe uh, moments of uh, uh, history of a pavilion is a Stonehenge that isn't just an open uh, pavilion uh, where people uh, were expressing themselves. And it's also maybe echoing uh, places of assembly like the um, Toguna, which, is, which are these um, structures that were built by the Dogon people in Mali with these heavy roofs and they were uh, people were obliged to sit in uh, and reach their decision uh, calmly because if they get excited and they uh, stand up, they hit their head so they cannot fight. So, so basically learning from these moments to kind of create a certain place for uh, maybe for serenity and uh, shying away from la large gestures and trying to think about the intimacy, about interiority in, uh, in this pavilion in that case. So the structure is about these uh, simple two columns that uh, are holding a beam that is spanning, and then the roof is a splitted structure uh, that echoes the leaf of a tree and uh, with these secondary structures. And the, the shape is really echoed with this uh, central uh, oculus as well. And then the table is custom made with a chair. It's about really also uh, the ability to touch, you know, the place that you sit on, and really again getting closer to the material and to to the sensitive space around. And then we can see also that this uh, the fret panels about is, uh, are about the light that comes in. And the, actually, what was interesting is to live also that space through the variation of light and uh, and mood uh, in in London and summer summer of London. So sometimes it's really bright inside, others it becomes dim. So it becomes like a light meter as well. And through that, we can feel really the passing of time, the passing of uh, you know the weather around. And now it's gone. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I think uh, I so much enjoyed that, and I, I feel like I sort of set you up for the for the talk by introducing you to units that are so aligned to this thinking. Absolutely amazing. So, okay, I'm sure there are some questions um, from the from the room. Does anyone have the first question? Thank you so much for the for the talk. Um, good question. How do you feel like when your your pavilion? is not there anymore. Uh, how, how, as an architect, <laughs> how does that make you, you feel? You have the curator of the pavilion is just <laughs> sitting next to you. <laughs> um, 
I think it's uh, it, that's the vocation actually of the pavilion uh, itself. And if you, when I was researching uh, the name of uh, pavilion, the etymology is papillon, is butterfly, and it's about uh, this, and it, it's uh, it's echoing actually a pleated form that is sitting on a very light structure, and that is here for a fleeting fleeting time, you know. And I like this idea that, and that's what creates the intensity of the pavilion is it's just there for a certain time and it pushes people to to spend the time and becomes a time apart and that was really beautiful because people were sitting there were spending three hours were you know writing or some people some students doing workshops so it pushes that kind of uh, time apart from programs that we see in our cities and inventiveness in relationship to such places and it was also thought as a dismantleable structure that is very very easily dismantleable, and I hope it happens smoothly uh, <laughs> lately. And uh, and then uh, to be remounted some remounted somewhere else. So hopefully we will see another life to it. The conclusion. Thank you. That was brilliant. I love the fact that your work is so much to do with the kind of earth and the growing of food and the growing of architecture are so beautifully aligned. I wonder if you could say a bit about stone and the Hermes talks that were yeah. that were focused on stone and will we be seeing a purely structural stone building from you very soon? Yes. <laughs> So the past two years, I was uh, following with Hermes uh, uh, Academy around stone. And so they have their foundation that is uh, tackling every two years one material. In the back, there was earth, uh, glass. And that was the first time that they were dealing with stone as a material. So we did one year where we worked on uh, with, uh, with a program that is really multidisciplinary, bringing uh, sometimes geologists, uh, historian, architects uh, to talk about this material that is very much of a living material and talks about our history. And then we ended up, uh, like the whole uh, the whole other year, uh, walking or moving around the, in France and in Italy to see quarries and then building something with stone. And that was really fantastic. So the, the, the outcome of what we've done will be soon exhibited in, uh, in a forest in France. Uh, and soon uh, to build with stone, uh, I have one project that is ongoing in uh, actually in uh, Portugal, and it's um, it's very interesting because the client had bought uh, a whole quarry of uh, spolia, so they left out of uh, stone quarries, and uh, we're really thinking how to use these to actually build as is. So it's a whole process now. It's much bigger than the brick, so. I'm starting to, uh, trying to accommodate from the hand uh, to these uh, large blocks. Okay. Um, hi. Um, lovely presentation. Uh, I wonder what's it like to, what's it feel to s basically start your practice with such amazing cultural projects? And, uh, and what's your favorite um, work out of all of them? Yeah. Um. Starting with the Estonian Museum was, um, I mean, it, it was really uh, amazing, uh, you know, venture because, uh, and it's uh, amazing learning because how to, you know, what is it, what is being an architect? That's what mainly I, I learned also because starting with a project that has a national importance, at 26 uh, I found myself in front of the government having to uh, you know defend to, to build this building. It was an anonymous competition, so when they opened uh, you know the. Uh, the envelope, uh, they first thought that we were Estonians, but then we arrived because it was very much understanding the side. And we arrived, we were like uh, one Japanese, one Italian, and uh, Lebanese, very young, and <laughs> we we're going to build your uh, national museum. So that was really intimidating, of course, in the beginning, but then structuring a team, uh, like do, actually bringing um, an old man, one of uh, the economists that was 60 years old. We, I worked with uh, at uh, my previous experiences, so I brought him with, uh, with us. He's old, but he didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but anyway, that it, it was a great adventure, actually, like understanding the dynamics. But also, the, in the beginning, when we won the project, actually, uh, there was a lot of debates about uh, this building, you know, this building that really links to the Soviet airfield, and that for them, or for some of the Estonians, was about monumentalizing this uh, airfield. So uh, why do we need to, uh, to keep this airfield? Let's erase it. Uh, so it was a lot of uh, also work of going to meet the people, trying to uh, talk about, you know, this past and what what is the interest to link to, the, to this past? How do we transform it? How do we acknowledge our past? How do, does it become a heritage and something that we can actually build upon? So that was very enriching in the beginning. And then afterwards, the struggle of, uh, you know, doing the design, but also of the project stopping, because after four years that we did the project, the project completely stopped because they asked money from the European Union, didn't get the money because they uh, said that this is uh, your national museum, why do we need to finance you? Plus, it's not even in uh, Tallinn, it's not in the, you know... uh, uh, city center, so and, and they were very pissed off. We don't do a Bilbao effect. We want to do our national building, and uh, so anyhow, that's that's also the time where you feel like architecture will never happen. You know, it's take it takes ten years. Uh, and then it happens, and then you see all these people working together, and this uh, fantastic director who's uh, an amazing woman pushing that project and uh, pushing that along us and. Uh, and then the building realized, and you realize how how much architecture is multifaceted, uh, and I can go on forever, actually. <laughs> Uh, yes, and uh, what's my favorite building? Uh, very difficult question. I think it's uh, what's very interesting is that uh, to think about an architecture architecture that, that is in constant flux. It's not about one building. It's about a uh, thought so, so process. It's about building knowledge, actually, through every project and trying to push the boundary in other projects even more and trying to learn from what you've done before to push uh, that further in the other project <coughs> rather than uh, you know individual icons that uh, one is uh, doing um thank you so much for your presentation it was amazing i have a question about the beirut building uh, n- near the port and uh, about the residential one uh, so throughout your work w- one thing that I really loved is that you try to blend the landscape with the buildings and study the land and the materiality of them and everything. And something that I find in Peru and similarly to my country, Cyprus, that the cities are a bit chaotic and things doesn't connect with each other a lot. And I wanted to ask if you find that very difficult um, to build something that connects to the surroundings or it was not a problem for you in that project because something that I'm really struggling when I go to cities in Cyprus, I'm like, why they place this here? Like, yeah, yeah. so. It's, um, it's interesting that in uh, such a context, actually within the chaos, you can find a certain, uh, sorry, uh, like a certain coherence or certain like uh, commonality. For example, in the context of Stone Garden, you can see these uh, buildings that are full of different windows where every window is placed differently within the context and within the uh, different uh, structures around. And that was something that uh, Stone Garden or the building is really continuing in a way, learning from that language. And maybe it's trying to find a certain uh, common thread or an order within that chaos. And I think it's also about us. We are very different human beings. We are also a certain chaos. So how do we create threads within uh, this chaos that uh, constitute us? Thank you so much. Hi, lovely presentation, by the way. I'm talking about your first project. So your first project is this amazing museum where you were talking about how you sprinkled these beautiful places in the design where people could come in and do what they please. So what did you anticipate these spaces to function as and how are they functioning today? Yeah. 
Um, that's the, the idea was actually to provide spaces that have certain qualities without anticipating their program. So really trying to, and it was a struggle. In, in every project, there are these kind of spaces and always like a kind of a struggle always to defend them along with your client because they're always like, but this is a waste of space. But this is not a waste of space. This is space, actually. It's the generosity of space. It's the space in between that becomes a flux of life, actually, that is in between a library, between a shop, and that has the quality of being uh, uh, like five meters high and has lateral light and has openings to the lake and that allows you these moments of contemplation but also allows people to meet here and maybe large events to happen and basically what you haven't previewed the creativity of us as humans to, to unfold and uh, at, at the end these are the places where actually they do many uh, things that you've not uh, expected as architect and that become possible because configure of configurations of light of uh, you know, of dimensions, of resources, and of relationships that you configure around uh, those spaces, like the uh, like the platform of the airfield, for example, became like uh, at some point a large um, uh, manifestation for a concert for Metallica. Uh, they were like uh, thousands of people. Like I didn't know they exist still, but they were like <laughs> there. It was amazing, and uh, and then you have also in uh, the building for uh, the leather manufacturer. Uh, this is a place, for example, the entrance place. It's just a courtyard. It's an empty courtyard, so it's just a thin facade, and it opens to the outside. Of course, you could say, say this is uh, a waste of uh, space. Why are you building this? And then there is nothing, but there is a lot. There is nature that is happening, and there is life that creates this uh, moment where you move from a very industrial context towards the inside and towards your work environment and places where you can use them and they become really part of the function. Thank you so much. That's beautiful to hear. After the lecture, I was curious about how you established the relationship with the artisans in the process of making. You were showing some pictures of how you work within the office and then how you um, create a dialogue with them, whether you learn from what they do or you suggest things to them or how, yeah. how is this relationship? Yeah, it's uh, it's very uh, um, it's very different according to the scale of the project. So when we're working on a, a smaller scale, like for example, I showed the boutique uh, for chocolate, or like um, we recently did a shop with all the elevation was done with a chiseled uh, pattern. Uh, and in that case, there is a meeting with the artisans themselves. Immediately, they come to my practice, to to the office, to the atelier. They they show me glass I go to their uh, you know manufacturer and uh, some of them have really amazing places because it's really uh, uh, like out of you know one of the glass makers works in a grotto for example and that makes these glass uh, works uh, and then it's a dialogue, really, like a drawing something, they produce it, and then the limit of the material talks about what you can do, what you cannot do. And then when you're working on a building scale, uh, it's about the timing, actually. You start, for example, for Hermès, we, in the beginning, I directly uh, looked at what, where are the local brickmakers, the artisanal brickmakers, uh, and then we call them and try to look for them during competition stage, so we can propose the building and know that we can actually produce the material that is needed. But then after, during, uh, before construction and tender stage, this is where I went there and then I looked at the material, looked at the, uh, you know, like the, um, the oven, the way they produce, I learned also from the, the, the cooking of this, uh, the, the bricks, because it's also about the temperature of the baking that uh, produced different colors, so it actually informed the color of the elevation. Uh, and the same in Beirut, because that was a process where uh, in the beginning, like the client was pushing for these uh, formworks where you create patterns and it looks like really very uh, plastic. Uh, I mean, it lacks all this work of the hand. And then looking, researching locally, trying to understand what we can do there, this plastering technique is really very much built in the culture and uh, maybe rethinking about uh, trying with them in place. 
and developing it. So there's always this experimental part where you kind of squeeze it in the process of, uh, of the work, but it's also actually generating the work as well. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, first off, I just want to thank you for such an inspiring um, presentation. There was one thing that you said that really stuck with me. Um, how do we build space, but how do we build space for people? And I, w I guess my question is, what do you think our next steps are within Beirut um, in a way that we can sort of bring the city back uh, in a way that's a bit different from what Solidaire did after the Civil War and how we can do it in a way that's maybe more true to our past and to our present as it is now. Thank you. That's, um, it's, uh, it's uh, what's uh, maybe what's particular about that context is that uh, there are always uh, initiatives done by individuals, by uh, non-governmental institutions that um, that are quite interesting in that context and that are very that kind of push the boundary uh, even more than a governmental and set institution. So how can we negotiate between both actually between the the, the necessity of having a collective Collective uh, governance and of having uh, the, the infrastructure present and keep that creativity, that capacity of the micro scale to be present and these contradictions to still happen because these moments of friction uh, that are present in uh, the city are very, uh, very enriching. They produce spaces that we don't see other wise and the ways of appropriating spaces that are always very uh, you know surprising like what is a sidewalk is all completely overturned what is an in between becomes a, a concept for a library that crosses a shop that becomes something else so it's really about this kind of uh, top bottom approach that is constant in constant uh, negotiation and constant contradiction if we can uh, continue continue to produce it in a way Thank you for this lovely presentation. Um, as you talked about the connection or keeping this connection with the tangible and intangible heritages in your projects and also the nature, long question short, um, how do you see this uh, relationship between the architects and the ecology in this coming future? Mm. I mean, we we are we have uh, I think we have uh, the capacity uh, to, to be critical thinkers before everything, like to be also having the tool uh, to uh, to challenge the status quo because the way we produce uh, the built environment today is completely contradictory to uh, to towards where we have to head, you know, the way we have to build and uh, the materials available. So we have to challenge materials, we have to challenge regulations because materials have to, uh, like sustainable materials, biosource or geosource materials have to become more frequent in our built environment. We have to cha challenge insurances because the material that is biosource is not insured uh, as is a material that is uh, there for uh, 20 years. You have to challenge the uh, financial uh, recipe of, uh, of a developer. So we are actually challengers in a way and we are also... Uh, Sometimes we have to become acrobats as well to be able to defend, uh, to, to build uh, again with bricks uh, while your client is very skeptical. How can we do 500,000 bricks and prove that it's possible actually and bring the, the, the team together and also build with very little budget. So let's make miracles. <laughs> um, again, it was wonderful thank and you. thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, with regard to your approach about nature and urban environment, uh, when I was looking at your landscape, uh, let's say landscape buildings, you're really trying to hide the building and protect the landscape, and that's very apparent and done very sens in a very sensitive way. And then the building in Beirut, while obviously it's a very emotional project because it's building back home and there's a lot of kind of like looking back at the memory, what could this building bring with the memory, um, kind of strikes me that you mentioned at a certain point that the, the geometrical result was part of the regulation. And I was really wondering how you see, how, if you can address like urban spaces in a wider sense, because 
I think Beirut was a very, probably a very specific space. Um, mm. And yet the materiality was very sensitive to, to the local environment. But the scale of it was outstanding when you mm. showed it in context. Mm. So what is your approach? Because it, it was so contradictory to your landscape approach. So I'm just curious yeah. about densification and yeah. Mm. I mean, in, in that context, in Beirut, uh, the scale is really, um, also the building is depending on how you perceive it. In some angles, you would see it very like a tiny building in relationship to the towers that are being built. One thing that you're subject to as an architect is that you're in front of a legal uh, framework also that pushes certain lands to build more because actually it gives the, the way for developers to build more because the regulation has changed. And then uh, the building next door is very small because it's uh, pertaining to an older regulation and the land that you have to build on has a bigger exploitation factor. So what do you do there? So you can you have to find you know the language where to to make your building the most uh, linked to its environment, the most anchored. And that's the struggle actually that the building embodies in its own architecture. So at the same time it wants to belong to earth, it wants to you know hug the site, it wants to really be the the lowest possible because it could have been much higher if it was on a smaller uh, footprint, if I decided to make it on a smaller footprint. Uh, and uh, and at the same time, also, it wants to create this kind of vernacular aspect with the openings, etc. But it does embody, actually, also the contradiction of uh, of that regulation and that, uh, you know, uh, question that you're faced with. And it uh, forced foretells what the others can do uh, next door. I mean, thankfully, for example, the building next door decided to renovate itself. It's, it was an old brother, brother, and they decided to renovate the building, not to destroy it, and actually it uh, it created rather <coughs> a con yeah, a kind of a respectful urban fabric around it, yeah. I mean, that's, um, it's, it's wonderful also to hear more and the kinds of questions that this is provoking. I, I think what's extraordinary about the work is it, when we talk about it, so much of it is grounded and therefore somehow profound in multiple meanings of the word. What I think is exceptional is uh, so much of the work, even the earliest projects, are monumental in scale and yet they somehow manage not to shout. And that's an immense achievement. And that, in, with the concern for nature and the concern for the environment, to do that with a delight, sensitivity, and intimacy, which is tremendously hard to achieve. There's so much to learn, and really, really, it's just a kind of a, a delight on the on screen and to hear you speak. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.